We're going to be in John chapter 13. Beginning in verse 18. I said last week that I really wanted to try to paint a picture of what was going on throughout this evening. We looked at Jesus as the suffering servant willing to take off the outer robe, put on the towel, wash his disciples' feet. But that wasn't the end of dinner. He had other things he had to teach them, other things he had to tell them. And again, John does not mention the Lord's Supper. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us about the institution of the Lord's Supper, but John does not. He centers his attention on the people around that table, on the relationship of Jesus to his disciples, and on some of the really deep, heavy, burdensome things that must have been going on in the mind of Jesus that night. We're going to start reading in verse 18 and read all the way down to verse 30. We're going to be comparing today and Lord willing next week two different guys who were at the table. Today we're going to talk about Judas and next week we'll talk about Peter. Now Jesus is surrounded at this table by people who in varying degrees will betray him. Judas who will actually sell him out to the enemy. Peter who will deny him three times. And the other ten who in various degrees will run away into the night and leave him alone to face that trial and that beating and that execution. But there's a difference in their hearts and I hope that we can see that there was a, a basic difference between Judas and Peter that condemned Judas while saving Peter. It's a predisposition toward evil or toward good. It's an existing ailment that gets exacerbated by the situation so that Judas gives in and gives up and Peter makes mistakes and goes forward. So Lord willing, over the next two weeks we'll highlight those two individuals. Start reading in verse 18. Jesus says, I'm not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen. But this is to fulfill the passage of Scripture, He who shared my bread has turned against me. I'm telling you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he said this, Jesus was troubled in his spirit, and he testified, Very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples started, uh, stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John's way of referring to himself, by the way, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It's the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I've dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Simon, uh, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, What you're about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money... Some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as, Jesus had taken, as soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was already night. I think the first thing we have to understand about Judas is that the things that he did that evening were satanic in nature. They weren't just a problem of 
his predispositions. However, for him to be used as he was by Satan, he had to be in a certain state of mind, in a certain state of spirit, for Satan to do the things that Satan was able to do. Uh, this is not the only place where it mentions that uh, Satan entered into him, but he is, uh, he is being used by the enemy, and yet it ends up to be to the advantage of the forces of the good. Look at John chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. John chapter 12, verse 1. This is one of those occasions where Jesus is honored by a woman who brings and anoints his feet. Six days before the Passover, so this is one week prior, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Mary took a about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet, wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Around the table, you have Simon Peter who tells John who wrote this. Ask Jesus who it is. John knew. Peter knew. Judas' predisposition. They knew what he was like. John mentions in his gospel, well, Judas was in love with money. And he used to take money out of the pouch when we were doing things and, and use them for his own uh, agenda rather than for the things that Jesus needed him to do. Uh, chapter 26, sorry. Verse 1. Matthew 26. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples... As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. The chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they schemed to arrest Jesus uh, secretly and kill him, but not during the festival, they said. There will be a riot among the people. Now skip over to verse 14. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. And from then on, G uh, Judas was watching for an opportunity to turn him over. So perhaps Jesus being anointed and this year's wages not coming into the coffers helped to move Judas in the wrong direction. He objected verbally out loud in front of everybody. Shouldn't we have taken that perfume and sold it and put it in the bag? John says, well, he didn't want it in the bag because he wanted to do something good with it. He wanted to put it in the bag so that he could spend it on himself. And then just four or five, six days later, here he is with the chief priests saying, how much will you give me to sell out my master? So he has a predisposition before Satan ever enters into him, but Satan does enter into him and he does uh, settle for 30 pieces of silver to turn Jesus over. There's a, a possibility here that maybe Judas wrestled with this decision in advance, that maybe he, he knew better but didn't do better. Let me ask us a question. Have you ever done anything wrong and you knew it was wrong when you did it? Sure we have. I wonder if Judas wrestled at all with this question. Think back to when Cain and Abel brought gifts to the Lord. And God really liked Abel's sacrifice of the flesh. Cain also brought a sacrifice from the fields. 
And God praised Abel, but He didn't praise Cain. And so Cain was furious. Do you remember what God told Cain? He said, sin is crouching outside your door. You'd better get in charge of it or it will consume you. That's where Judas was that last week. Sin was crouching outside his door. And he was equally as effective at overcoming it as Cain was. He gave in to it. He allowed it. He acted on it. As Cain killed Abel, so Judas turned Jesus over for 30 pieces of silver. Here's a couple of things that I find interesting anyway. Again, you've got all these folks around the table. Who knows what? What Judas did was known in advance by Jesus. He tells them, that not all of them are pure, not all of them are clean because he knows who it is that's going to betray him. How long has he known? Did he know the day that he called Judas? Did he know that he called Judas because Judas was predisposed, uh, predisposed to be this way? Was Judas there for a reason from the beginning? I don't know. I do know that when Jesus was washing feet, he washed Judas' feet. I'm not sure. I, I went through and tried to figure out whether Judas was still there when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. It's kind of hard to tell. There's a point at which Jesus dips the bread and gives it to Judas in Matthew, and then the Lord's Supper is after that. So if he leaves immediately upon receiving the bread, he may have been gone before the Lord's Supper is instituted. But he was in the room just prior at least perhaps during Jesus describing, take this, it's my body. Take, drink this. This is my, my blood given for the new covenant. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, Matthew, Mark, and John mention Judas at the dinner and they mention the discussion of who was going to betray Jesus. Look over at Luke 22. Take a look at that little discussion. Luke 22. We'll just touch on it here and we'll come back to it here in a minute. Luke says, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you, but the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it's been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. And they began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. So that sounds like he's still in the room. Again, really kind of hard to tell by bringing all the gospel accounts together. But look at Matthew 22. Uh, Matthew, I'm sorry, um, wrong place again, 26. Matthew 26. Can you tell it's been a long week? Love you guys, appreciate your patience. Matthew 26, beginning in verse 20. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Then Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about Him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. And then Matthew singles Judas out. Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. All those guys around the table. Jesus knows exactly who will betray him. And yet he still treats Judas as he treats the rest. And each of them asks the same question. Is it me? Is it me? Is it me? 
until Judas says, Surely, Lord, you don't mean me. A little bit later, Jesus says to Judas, Whatever it is that you need to go do, you go get it done. The disciples were still in the dark. They still thought that maybe Judas was going to buy more bread or to go give a gift to the poor. But it never entered their minds that Judas was going out to get ready to betray Jesus. Here's what Judas was doing. He went out and he went to find the high priest. He went out to find those leaders with whom he had cut a deal. He knew that as soon as Jesus finished that meal, that they would go out to the Mount of Olives. He knew where Jesus would be the rest of the night. He always did that. Every time they did Passover meal together, they went out to the Mount of Olives. It was just the way they did things. Judas knew Jesus. He knew him well. He knew his habits. He'd been taught by that man for three years. He'd been loved by that man for three years. Now he knows where to find him when he wants to give him up. Look around the table again. There are several people sitting there, but Peter tells John to ask Jesus who it is that's going to betray them. Matthew was sitting at the table. Matthew writes about it later in his gospel. John was sitting at the table. He writes about it later in his gospel. The gospel of Mark was probably a collaboration between Mark, who was an assistant of Peter's, and Peter himself. So three of the guys who were at the table were connected to Gospels who told about what happened at the table, but they didn't know it at the time. At the time, they just thought Judas was another one of them who had a predisposition to taking things out of the bag. Let me give you some take home. Even though Judas was with Jesus, at the table with Jesus, what would you, is there enough? What, what would the ticket cost? Right? Have you seen some of the ridiculous tickets to watch old people rock groups play music? Right? The groups that were famous when I was a kid, they're still playing music and people are paying like ridiculous amounts of money to go watch these guys in concert. If you could have dinner with Jesus... What's the ticket cost? None of us could afford it. I don't think if we put all our money together, we could get a seat for one of us. These guys were at the table surrounding Jesus. John was sitting next to Jesus or reclining next to Jesus. The old translations say he was reclining against Jesus. I've always had that picture in my mind since I was a little kid. The idea that John had finished eating or was in the midst of eating and he relaxed and just kind of laid back and he was actually using Jesus for a pillow. What would you pay? How much would that cost? But even though Judas was with Jesus, even though Judas had a place at the table, his heart was open to the influence of evil. Just being a Christian does not give us a pass. Just being in Christ doesn't stop the temptation. Just because we have a relationship with the creator of the universe does not mean that our physical side just gives in, gives up, and leaves us alone. We still have to deal with the world as it is and with our desire, our desires as they may be. And even when he wanted to undo the damage, he couldn't find a righteous way to get it done. Look over at Matthew 27. This is kind of as things were being said and done. Matthew 27, beginning in verse 1. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans on how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, and they led him away and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse, and he returned the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. 
What's that to us? They replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and he left. And he went out and he hung himself. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, It's against the law to put this in the treasury since it's blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That's why it's been called the field of blood to this day. King James gives us the old word, hakeldama. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord had commanded me. Judas felt sorry. Judas gave back the money. But Judas could never get past what he had done. That's why in the 21st century you will never travel through Europe and see great big basilicas and beautiful buildings named St. Judas Cathedral. He never got over it. He never got past it. He left a legacy that is absolutely besmirched to the point that no one thinks highly of Judas except for one day of his life. He was just like everybody else in the group. Yeah, he had a predisposition to, you know, kind of helping himself to the money in the purse. But it's that one thing that he allowed himself to do that he just couldn't get over. Christian, guard your heart. Know yourself well enough to know your predispositions. Know what it is that's out to get you. Let the Spirit of God dwell in you richly as you overcome those things. Don't leave room for that one day when Satan comes in and makes you do things you can't undo. He left a legacy of sadness and hatred and regret. Well, Lord willing, next Sunday sermon will be a little happier. We'll talk about Peter. What did Peter do? He denied him three times. But he was able to move forward because Peter had a predisposition too. And Peter's predisposition was one of change and growth and being motivated to be like the heart of Jesus. His heart was still in, open to the influence of good. So Lord willing, we'll talk about those things next Lord's Day.